The air is chilly for late September. It passes through the vents of my harness, causing a slight chill to my bone. I will need my coat, it seems. Passing through the front yard of the men, I walk along the three-foot-high walls that have already begun to boast curling vines of pumpkin and squash. The land around the manor is covered with such various fruits this time of year, accompanied by the turning colors of yellow and brown leaves. The servants of my estate tend to the numerous piles set about the acreage. The men with their brown coats and caps, the women dressed similarly, except for the substitution of long skirts. The carriage is at the end of the stone cobbled drive, waiting to whisk me away. There. I see Cronklick's unusually long top hat, bobbing up and down in a panic. He is inspecting the buggy as if he lost something precious to him. As I approach, he has almost fully inspected the team of mares and the black coach. He starts at my approach, but recovers with uncanny vigilance. Dressed in one of his finest gray suits, it is the color he insists on wearing. He shakes his head worriedly. Confound it all to hell. That's what this situation has led me to say. I tell you, when all the bergamot has gone missing, it is a bad day indeed to travel. What with the cool air about and endless bombardment of foliage, tis no wonder that the blackest of tea should be consumed. And yet here I am, and there you stand. And not an ounce of bergamot to be passed around. I'm unsure if he is in a stable state when he continues further. By God's good grace, Lord Wolfgang, here is your coat. Graciously, I take the long mantle of black and cover myself, welcoming the warmth. I look at Cronklick with slight annoyance. You know, I dislike when you use my proper title in such a way. There is no need, James. A look of knowing shows on his face. Indeed, Tanner, indeed, you are correct, but I merely prepare for the character that will undoubtedly appear later this day. We can't have civilians seeing your lordship's servants addressing him by first name. Twould be dishonorable. Indeed, is all I say as I inspect the cargo. You will find that all preparations have been readied, Cronklick replies, a slight hesitation in his delivery. Satisfied with the walk around, I enter into the coach and lean my head out the window. Yes, James, it is duly noted, more bergamot for the manor. A smile of perfectly straight teeth shows his contentedness as he ascends onto the buggy. Excellent, Lord Wolfgang, and he cracks the whips, sending the black carriage into a speedy departure. I nearly lose my head from the sudden jolt and retreat back into the stuffy interior. The wind whips my hair about as we take flight down the avenue of tall conifer trees, which reach as high as the lowest clouds. A quick turn at the drive's end, and we are no longer on my estate. Into the village of Roland we go. It's a good day, with the air crisp and the villagers working outside looking productive. The hustle and bustle will continue to the beginning of winter, for when the cold snow comes off the Cordova mountains to the north, there will be no more passage out of the valley. The quaint town of Roland will settle in for its hibernation, and those who do not prepare for the solstice will suffer like they always do. Pothole after pothole, we descend into town, the clatter of hooves upon upturned pebbles from the cracks of the cobbles. We pass shacks, houses, and other mansions reaching the base of the town, its center the deepest deep dip in the valley, then the long climb back up through the moist streets. We see Albiston Church on the right, with its lofty priests tending to the roadside wash of passing buggies. The might of the Holy Cross sits proudly just below the nape of the triangular-shaped roof, a symbol to all that sanctuary awaits for those inside chased by demons. It's a place to visit the choir and share one's earnings. Another pothole returns my mind to the inside of the carriage and I see that Cronklick has come far more prepared than anticipated. 
I open a trunk that lies underneath the opposite seat. Inside lie all the necessary tools for any unfortunate circumstance. Wooden stakes and holy water. Enough to take on a brigade of vampires. My hair dashes about wildly as I lean my head out the window. The air stings my watery eyes. I shout to Conklick, Are you anticipating something I'm not aware of? He smiles back at me, keeping his focus on the road. Nothing out of the ordinary, sir. A quick snap of the reins and the carriage lurches again. I fear he is going to snap my neck. Almost out of the village now, the increasing onset of trees comes forward quickly and the building decline just as fast. Out of civilization, we speed into the gloom of the surrounding woods, following the great Carpello Road. The sun is near its midday travel by the time Cronklick slows the pace of the horses. Somewhere through the foothills of Cordova, along the outskirts of Rowan, is our destination. A hovel, lost and forgotten, which few, in, which few inhabit. For another hour we bounce along the dirt road, the potholes now replaced with roots and rocks. Off in the distance, above the tree line, I make out the faint shattery remains of a Gleasing castle, a memory I still hold vivid to this day. I went there by personal invitation from a Gleasing himself, Lord of the Vampires to deliver him the one item that all vampires fear most, the hand of God, a relic so powerful it has the ability to revert a vampire back to its original human form by the mere touch of it. But Iglesian did not fear it. In fact, he embraced it. He wanted to become human again, and when he took the hand of God from me, something unexpected happened. All the time he lived as an immortal vampire aged him within seconds. Did he know this? I'm not quite sure. In the brief moments following, he was rendered to dust. I watched his ashes scatter across the castle floor and barely escaped with my life. The whole castle came down in a crumbling demise. Even to this day I try to make sense of his suicide, but can't. There is the familiar sound of, whoa, good lads, as the carriage is brought to a sliding halt. Cronklick is always trying to impress with his superb driving skills. Looking out the window, I see a dark force in all directions, but no place of destination. I make to lean my head out the window to question our sudden pause when something catches the corner of my eye, an enormous spider, larger than two hands side by side. It makes its way along the headboard. Its silvery hair brushes along the wood, shuffling and scraping. Suddenly, it's flattened by a wooden cane. Crocklick's face appears in the window. He no longer smiles. We have arrived at the Danbury Hovel, Lord Wolfgang, he says in a clear, distinct voice. I step out into the shade as the scarce sunlight dodges between the trees. I make my way along the soft earth to a beaten down cottage, initially blocked from my line of sight by the horses. The smell of death lingers in the air. Cronklick is mere steps behind me as he follows, his fantastic suit a severe contrast to the surroundings. He carries his long cane with him while speaking about the cottage just yards ahead of us. Not too bad, I've seen worse. As have I. My eyes scan the area, and there is movement to the left. A small gathering of people huddled together, all of them appearing quite nasty, some covered in mud, others in blood. Among them stand two adults and four children, most likely relatives of the victimized woman inside. I hear them whimpering in the distance, shaking their heads, holding their ears. One of the adults holds a cross in his hand, praying. I can only imagine what they saw last night. I motion with my head in their direction. You know what to do. There are no further words exchanged between us. 
for Cronklick understands his role. Too many times we have seen the abomination of such tragedies. The vampires always strike these secluded areas deep within the woods, attacking the innocent, killing children, women, and grown men. It matters not. Those unprepared cannot stop the attacks. That is why I am here. I try not to pay attention to the adults talking with Cronkley. Their words are full of dread and sorrow. I focus on the house before me instead, taking its worn appearance. Taking in its worn appearance. A door, a window, not much more. There is nothing that appears unusual, except for the huge spider infestation that seems to have taken over the corners of the front of the room. The silver spiders are all over the woods. I've heard tale they are harmless, but who's to say that their numbers can't overrun? Stepping up to the door, the children are whimpering louder than before. I wonder if they weep for their dead mother or harbor worries for my own sake. There is no doubt those children have heard of me. This isn't the first time I've been around these parts. I attempt to test the handle to see if it's locked, but there is no handle. Dozens of silver spiders crawl along the horrible thatching of the roof. With my mantle com comfortably covering my shoulders and weapons, I pull the makeshift door of planked wood open letting the dust take its course. Mold and the stench of death fill my nostrils as I stoop through the low opening. The small room is dark and full of smoke. There are beams of light seeping through the window. From what I can deduce, the hearth lies on the other side of the room and its smoke smothers everything with its nauseous fumes. I pull the color of my mantle over my nose and mouth, attempting to squelch the, the desperate urge to cough. Immediately my eyes fall upon a lifeless figure on the floor by the only table in the common room. It is too dark to tell if it is a man or a woman, so I assume it's the woman I'm looking for. As I approach slowly, I keep a mental note of my surroundings. Scattered barrels, two chairs, and a large pile of straw that is stained a dark brown. Standing above the body, the usual scent comes from it, not the death that normally comes from human remains, but the stench of cloves and burnt leaves, the undead. Instinctively, my hand grips the wooden stake on my belt and I kneel to turn her over. The corpse turns with ease. Rigor mortis has not set in yet, another sign of what I must do and soon. But for final confirmation, I move a lock of the woman's hair away from her neck, exposing what I have already calculated. Two puncture wounds along her milk-white skin. I say a soft prayer over her forehead while I slip one of God's instruments from my belt. I release you from your infernal bonds. Just as quick as the words flow from my tongue, I drive the wood deep into her heart. Her eyes open wide with the familiar pain I have dealt so many times. A gasp escapes as she passes on to true death. She tries to raise her head from the ground, but my hand firmly keeps it down. Go now, woman. Pass on to God. Be with him now. Her body goes limp. A door from the other, another part of the room flings open as something runs straight for me. It screeches a fearful cry and I have no time to react. The child clings to me as if I were his father, sweating and covered in grime. He cries and cries hysterically, shouting incoherently. I do my best to calm the boy, but he keeps looking at his dead mother. Had he been in the closet hiding all this time? Seems there were five children, not four, and as his tears finally begin to let up, I notice a place on his neck he covers with his hand. Blood trails from underneath, and I am left with a dread of the worst kind. My mom! My mom! says the boy, as I move his hand away from two holes similar to the ones in his mother's neck. 
holding the slippery stake. A moment passes, and I know I cannot do it. He's just a boy. And suddenly I'm thinking of Dorian. Could I drive a stake through a boy who reminded me so much of my son? Little blonde girls, large dark eyes. The boy seems the same age when Dorian performed one of his first plays. So young, so innocent. I've only seen a child turn vampire once. I couldn't kill it then, and I won't do it now. I rise from the floor and make to leave, shivering, leaving the little vampire to his perished mother. Muttering deliriously to himself, he suddenly calls out after me, Please, mister! Please, help me. Are you going to leave me? I say nothing as I pass out into the daylight, knowing the boy cannot follow. Outside, Cronklick is having a difficult time detaining one of the four children. Walking slowly back to the carriage, I see the girl running over to me, her long braids of golden hair matted down with filth. Cronklick chases right after her, but it's too late. She grabs my arm. Dirt marks her face like a homeless child. Mr. Wolfgang, sir, please, what of our mother? I have no words for her as I look into her hazel eyes. I see the unmistakable fear of helplessness and unknowing, the doubt that ebbs in all humans. I grip her shoulders just like I would with Dorian. Please. See to your brothers and sisters. They need you now. I turn her away as Cronklick approaches me. Terribly sorry, Lord Wolfgang. There are quite a handful, he says out of breath. I look at him sternly, waiting for his full attention. The others. Do they carry any sign? He looks back at the bundle of children and then to me. None. Good, I say, as I turn around to head for the carriage. Evil prevail prevails in this house, Cronklick. The vampire will return if it's not purified. Yes, of course, Lord Wolfgang. There is a shout of glee from the girl suddenly. She runs to the cottage's only window, yelling with joy, Michael! It's Michael! Look! He's alive! It is so much harder knowing their names. I eye Cronklick sternly. Get her out of there. And Cronklick, I say, pausing for a moment as he looks at me with unease. Make it quick. It is now late afternoon and the sun has ducked behind the hills. As he pulls her away from the window, I see Michael staring at his brothers and sisters through the window pane. Sorrow besets his face. I can only imagine what the little man is thinking. His gaze turns to me, and I look away.
Sparrow.